If you look at the generation of American artists who f first engaged with the French Impressionists um, in the late 19th century, uh, I think head and shoulders above the rest is Child Hassan. He holds a, a very high place in American art history. He was a great synthesizer of ideas. Plus, he had just a, an extraordinary natural talent. Looking at the literature on Hassam and his experience at an Apple door, it was pretty clear to me that previous art historians had not really looked at the way Hassam had interpreted the various geological and just landscape features on the island. Some of his best known paintings done on Apple door had never been identified. The locations hadn't been identified. So that was, uh, seemed to be that's a good reason to do an exhibition. But I want them to fall in love with the paintings, and I want them to see a world through an artist's eyes. There was a real almost obsession with this island that comes across in his paintings. He painted, we estimate, at least 10% of his total production on this one little rock. I mean, we're talking of an island that's a little over 90 acres. And then selecting from that a very small core in our case, 39 paintings, oils and watercolors, that best represent him on Appledore over the course of his time there. They really represent the artist at the top of his game. Performing as an artist, trying to come to terms with this one small rock in the, in the middle of the Atlantic. And that, to me, is the most compelling part of the whole exhibition is just one artist, one rock, this is what happened. The island itself is a player as much as the artist. Most people have never had an experience of a, of a main island, but they're magical places. And Hassam clearly understood the magic and had a way of channeling that into his pictures. The complexity of the geological terrain on Appledore was a great challenge for him. I think he just enjoyed, how do I bring this out? He's kind of understanding the rocks by painting them. Located six miles off the coast of southern New Hampshire and Maine, Appledore Island was first explored by Captain John Smith in 1614. To have a major American artist spend so many summers out there painting, I needed to see it. I was researching the paintings. I became interested in where the paintings were painted. And so I sent a, a kind of a cold inquiry to the Shoals Marine Lab. The inquiry was forwarded to Hal Weeks. He was a marine biologist but he had, a, had developed a, a special kind of hobby. I had just gotten my first digital camera, and Hassam images were starting to become available on the web. And so, just out of curiosity, I started clicking on them. And I said, I know where that is. I know where that is. Kind of for fun, I would say, well, can I find where he was when he did this? And then slowly over time, I developed a collection of digital images of his paintings and 
in some cases, a matching photograph where I felt like I had was pretty darn close to where he had his easel. Nobody knows that island better than Hal. He'd been out there many, many summers, scrambled over all of the rocks, and he had assembled quite an interesting notebook of images of Hassam paintings and their identified locations. He came down to North Carolina and showed me this notebook and it just blew me away. And then Hal invited me out to Appledore and it was just a magical experience for me just to, to be on that island. You hold up an image of the painting in the spot and it's amazing. The correspondences are so close. Even the, uh, his understanding of the way the rocks are behaving and the direction of the granulation of the rocks, he's translating that into very quick, thick, impressionist brush strokes. And he got the waves crashing over the ledge exactly right. And Duck Island off in the distance is perfectly positioned. He would often use Duck Island or the other surrounding islands in to sort of define the horizon. And then maybe look a little bit this way because there's another painting that's right over here. Okay. The comparison of the images to, with the actual sites really opened up a whole new way of looking at Hassam and how he produced his images, how he chose the particular site, how he interpreted them. The idea of the exhibition really gelled at that time. The painting Jellyfish, it's a beautiful painting from close to the end of Hassam's time on Appledore. And it was one of the most difficult for us to locate. Jellyfish being very weak swimmers, you're not going to find them you know, where there's a lot of water movement. So that's when we started looking at the southwest and close to uh, one of the few cottages that remained on the island, we found the cove, and there it was. You know, the, everything lined up perfectly. And it was because of Hal and his knowledge of jellyfish that we got there, because we never would have found it otherwise. Frederick Child Hassan was born on October 17, 1859, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. He started his career as an illustrator. Like many artists, started as, a, as an illustrator, but always had the ambition for the fine arts and to, to move into painting. And of course he had the ambition to go to Paris because every artist of his generation in America was trying to get to Paris. It's the center of the art world. You talk about the transition between maybe the bright colors of the Grand Prix Day pictures versus the rainy day scenes of either the Parisian ones or the Boston ones. It speaks to the fact that he was already being identified in his early career in Boston as an urban chronicler, as some French artists were doing, but that one critic said he ought to come in out of the rain. In other words, that he kept doing these, these rainy day effects. And, and later on, critics responded when they saw the bright colors of some of his sunlit effects in, in Paris and, you know, gave him great, you know, applause for, for doing so. He brought back ideas that he found there and grafted them on to the realist traditions that you find in American uh, landscape painting um, to, to come up with a very strong personal approach to Impressionism. Hassan was known as, you know, an artist in the Impressionistic style really is in the early 1890s. So, so people knew that it, it was a good thing to uh, identify him with, but he did many other things besides just using impressionistic brushwork. So it's hard to link him just with French Impressionism, which often the terms collide. Hassam just really bristled at being labeled an Impressionist because I think partly because he didn't want to be perceived as a camp follower to the French. He really saw what he was doing 
in what may be considered an impressionist style, but he was trying to get to the reality of the scene as much as possible. Um, using impressionist techniques or some of the techniques that he might have borrowed or learned from the from the French, but he really did see what he was doing was not creating something so ephemeral as an impression, but a much more realistic interpretation of nature. He was the most prolific of the artists of his generation. In fact, that was one of the things that a lot of people held against him because he never seems to have edited his work. He didn't see that was his responsibility. He just painted the pictures, he hung them up, sold them, and he let the critics and whoever else um, give the thumbs up or thumbs down. The proof is in the pudding. He is a very prolific artist and, you know, and I'm aware of a lot of minor works, you know, but what you really, and, and they should be noted because it, it informs you about where he was and what he was thinking and studies and um, whatnot. But, but in the end, there are some fantastic pi pictures that he created, even if you were to only distill that to your, you know, your top 10%. I mean, that he would have, he would be remembered for that. He was an enormously talented artist. Hassan was lauded in his lifetime as one of the best American watercolorists. I mean, up there with Homer and Sargent because he had great facility and technique. Now, he didn't always do great watercolors, but when he did fantastic watercolors, they are, I think, his most memorable works. Among his best work of all, and in watercolor, would be the series of Celia Thaxter's Garden and these vivid, riotous colored renditions of her flowers and very free, very expressive, unfettered. He didn't want to schlep all this stuff down a, a slippery slope onto a very narrow ledge. It was dangerous for one thing, it was certainly awkward. So that you find many of the watercolor subjects in 1912 are of these somewhat inaccessible places. There's one ledge in the northeast, which is about halfway down from the headland, and you had to scramble down to, the, to that ledge, and it's like a very shallow balcony without a rail, and it looks out over a narrow cove. And it's a, it's a beautiful place, but you can't see Hassam t taking his whole painting kit down there, but he could take his watercolors. All you need with watercolors is just a block of paper, your little tin of watercolor paints, and some brushes. A lot of the detail, the, the whole context of the landscape is no longer necessary for him. He really does close in on a very small point of view and paints that so that they're almost abstract. He created some of the most adventurous watercolors of his career on that one ledge. Spanning three decades, Child Hassam's work on Appledore Island began around 1882. He was befriended by Celia Thaxter, a well-known poet whose cottage and garden also hosted an artist salon adjacent to the hotel her father had built. Celia was a very engaging figure. She gathered friends um, easily and Hassam, I think, was really drawn to the island because of her, and she wrote beautifully about the island. In fact, most, most people really see the island through Celia's writing on the Isles of Shoals. One of her roles in support of the hotel was to coax and invite a lot of her literary and intellectual artist friends out to the island so as to raise the, the tone of the clientele at the hotel, to, to give it greater prestige but it became one of the reasons that a lot of people would go out to the Appledore House was to meet Celia, uh, the famous poet. It was a very uh, active, loud resort. Hundreds of people would be out there. The dining rooms sat 300. And Hassam went out there and certainly enjoyed the company. There was a group there and there was a great convivial sharing and it was a party every night. I mean, it was a different time. It was pretty much a busman's honeymoon where he would go and enjoy himself out there and he would paint some pictures and he'd enjoy himself some more. 
He was only one of many artists whom she supported and um, uh, had affection for. I think she knew that he was going to have great success. I think she could see sort of a precocious quality even when he first came out there. The fact that she got him to be the artist affiliated with her book, An Island Garden. It was not a group of artists that she conscripted to do these illustrations, it was Hassam, and it became a really pivotal mark for him to have you know, created this body of work. So she really lured Hassam out there and gave him his first great subject, her garden. And he really came to sort of see Appledore and the Isle of Shoals as a whole through Celia's eyes. Hassam set up his easel sometimes in the garden, sometimes in the banks of poppies that spilled over from the garden and sort of cascaded down. And he would paint through the poppies so they dominate the foreground. But then you're looking out at Bab's Rock in the cove distance. And that was sort of Hassam's introduction to the island. He, he saw the island first through Celia's garden. After she dies, he finds his own Appledore, I think. And that's when he ventures beyond the hotel precinct into the wilder areas of the island and starts to paint the rocks and the, the sea crashing on the, the ledges. And he finds that subject fascinates him for 20 years afterwards. He keeps coming back and sometimes painting the same seen, but he reinterprets it. After she died, he didn't go for a few years, but then he returned for more than a decade repeatedly, and there were connections. There were people he knew, he socialized, but really I think he was going there for this spectacular island and the fact that nature afforded him this opportunity to look at the scene under different situations, under different light, and different times of the day. It allowed him to I think hone his artistic vision and to be an artist. Sunsets were a big theme for, for Hassam and it was what everybody talked about when they were out on Appledore. You're looking west across the water to the, the far edge of New Hampshire and sunsets are pretty spectacular, almost unworldly. One of the things that he, he liked to do was to take the, the wooden lids of cigar boxes, which there must have been lots of cigar boxes on the, at the hotel, but the wooden lids were a very convenient painting surface. It was just a perfect little size wood panel that you could almost hold in your hand, and that he did quite a few of them, we think from you know porches or different places up up top of the harbor where the, they were convening, presumably at, you know, what should I, cocktail time? I don't know, but the sunset time. He would take these beveled wood lids and very quickly sketch a sunset. He's working against time. It's a challenge for him. Can I get it right? Can I mix these colors and get the arrangements of the clouds and all of that before it disappears, before the sun sets? And the, he, made an unknown number of these. We're, we're showing six in the exhibition. And, it's, and they, they just show the different types of clouds and lighting effects that are found on Appledore. And I think they're some of the most engaging pictures in the show. It shows his, his virtuosic talent. He can put, put a picture together really, really quickly. He knows exactly what paint is going to do and how the colors are going to behave. He's a, a consummate craftsman that way. If you're forced to make quick decisions about colors and composition and such, it, it really does sharpen your, your talent. They had this great sense that you're catching a, a moment in nature and it was quick and it was vivid and it was personal and it was done. 
and many of them, you know, ended up being given to probably the people that he was sitting with on the porch. One of the great surprises of this exhibition was discovering two pictures and how they related to one another. The sun rising over the eastern sea with a few sea rocks in, in the foreground. And it's a gorgeous picture. It's, it's one of the most evocative of paintings of Appledore. Then we found a companion to it in a collection in California that was a moonrise over the exact same spot, the same sea rocks. What Hassan was capturing was just some of the boulders that are immediately offshore that were just uh, peering above the tide. You can take a compass azimuth on the axis of the cove and just using that as a reference, say, okay, when was sunrise at that azimuth or when was moonrise at that azimuth? And then you can go to the, uh, the website of the, uh, the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. and plug in you know, that information and you can determine at what date in a given year the sun would have risen at that azimuth or the, a full moon would have risen at that azimuth. And so that enables us to narrow down the likely time that those paintings were done in their respective years to late summer. I'm sure he was on, on the beach. He got up at 4.30, which is amazing for Hassam to imagine him getting up at 4.30, but he, he must have gone down there. The moon and the sun are in the exact same location. The tonality of the two pictures has changed because one is morning and one is evening. And the tide in the moonrise picture is a little lower so that there are more sea rocks showing. But otherwise, they're identical compositions and clearly intended as a pair. One is sunrise, one is a moonrise. The sunrise picture is 1890, painted in the first year that Hassam spent an extended time out on Appledore. And the moonrise picture is nine years later, 1899. What do these paintings mean? Hassam didn't paint in pairs. This is a, a nearly unique instance where Hassam is, is putting two pictures together and we don't know what he's saying. We don't even know if they were ever exhibited together. We have to assume that the earlier painting, the sunrise painting, was on Appledore during the 1890s because he had to have used it as the template for the moonrise picture. Where was it on Appledore? Could have been in Celia's house she hung pictures from floor to ceiling in her salon. It could have been in the hotel. It could have been in a number of the other cottages that were related to the hotel. I would like to think it would in Celia's house, but we have absolutely no evidence at this point. But we do know that these pictures had meaning for, for Hassam over and above just being individual paintings of a moonrise and a sunset. He put them together. Why, we don't know. We're gonna put them together in this exhibition for the first time, maybe ever, but certainly in over 100 years. What is interesting about his paintings, for the most part done on Appledore, is that the hotel doesn't figure into it at all. And it is almost like Hassam is, is willing the hotel away and imagining Appledore as this pristine, primordial island. In Hassam, it was clear, even when there was a big party going on, he would traipse off and do his own thing, and you would see a very unpeopled landscape in the midst of what was obviously a, a, a social environment. You know, he had his time. The, 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 art, the island obviously spoke to him. We've tried to show the major areas of the island in the exhibition, selecting the pictures so that as you wander around the exhibition, you're also wandering around the island. And I like people to come away with a sense of being there, whatever there is, but being there, being in a special place for that time that they're in the exhibition and to really feel the power of art in the way that it fires the imagination and, and places you in 
places you've never been and, and evokes feelings that um, you might not have unless you're on the headlands of Appledore looking at a sun, sunset and feeling the breeze. You can feel the breeze in Hassam's pictures. You can feel that silvery summer light. Obviously, he loved the community of Celia Thaxter and his friends, but what drew him back, I think, was the nature. If we could have two months off on an island without our phones, I mean, you know, it, it's it, it, it's a different time. It, it harkens back to a time when you really took a summer off, and you thought, and you were with people, and there was socialization, and you had retreat and reflection and renewal. I think that's what I think that's what Apple was for him, and. And I think that the, the sort of physical evidence of that, um, you know, particularly when some of them are as luscious and as beautiful as his watercolors and some of his oils, I mean, how can you not smile when you walk through that and, and, and think about it in terms of your own life and a, you know, more pastoral, reflective time? He was a very good businessman, managed his career quite expertly and ended up a very wealthy man. He actually had a remarkable impact for being such a uh, curmudgeon or such a you know establishment figure that you'd think of by the time of his death in 1935 but you know what he did he didn't have any children and he left a rather considerable estate to the American Academy of Arts and Letters with specific stipulation that his works be sold over time to fund something that was called the Hassam Fund which purchased contemporary artwork by American and Canadian artists for museums He's had a pretty considerable effect over the years. Mm -hmm.